question. Good evening. I'm Dr. Gus Pennings, and I'm not there with you at present this evening, but I'll be doing it remotely from here at home. And uh, I'd like to call this regularly scheduled December the 7th, 2020 board meeting to order at this time. Would you please rise and join the board to vote the silent reflection for this opportunity to thankful for those things which we have to be thankful, but also to clear our hearts and minds for the business we're going to consider here this evening. So, a moment of silent reflection. Thank you. Would you please join the board of studying our country with the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Interesting. Uh, our first item uh, this evening is uh, the approval of minutes for meetings held on November the 10th and the 16th. And that's the 12th on our agenda. But uh, those, I think, have already been approved. Is that correct, Ms. Blaine? I have to verify that still, but um, I've missed getting it loaded to your packets. Okay. Well, we will go ahead and approve November the 10th and 16th as you received electronically. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes for meetings held on November the 10th and 16th, 2020? So moved. Mrs. Kaufman moves. Is there a second to the motion? So, what, which one are we on? I couldn't understand. Number three, approval of the minutes. Yeah, I know. Which, which minute? The 10th and the 16th. Uh, I have a question on the 16th. Item 9A. Says uh, permits for Cherry River Cider being still held up due to the city of Richwood requiring additional H and H studies that according to FEMA are not required. Uh, I have uh, letters here between the engineers and FEMA, uh, if I may read this, this is Go ahead. Go ahead. This is from uh, Chris Arbor, the uh, insurance director, flood, flood insurance director. Uh, Thanks, I think you should proceed with setting up a meeting in the ordinance that states any development in the floodplain requires an H&H &H study and the definition of development states the following. Any man-made change to improved or unimproved real estate, including but not limited to buildings or other structures, mining, dredging, filing, grading, paving, excavation or drilling operations. In other words, they have already performed these acts in the floodway, so the ordinances require the H&H &H study. Any questions, please let me know. And the reply by Elizabeth Granson of FEMA says simply agreed. So FEMA does not disagree. Well, respectfully, what was mentioned was the email that I shared with you previously, and it also was from Chuck Grishaber, and it did say that FEMA had agreed in that aspect as well. So if FEMA has done some type of reversal since that initial email, I did share that with you, Mr. Moose, and everybody on the board. So that was part of the record. And if it has been reversed since that time, then that's, then that's a reversal. But I did share with you, you have a copy of it as well as everyone else. And it was from Chuck Grishaver, and, he, and it does say in that email that it was that they had okayed with FEMA. Okay, so how should the minutes read then? That's what was presented that at that time. Presented. That's what, what, what was presented, presented at that time. So we don't, I can't change those minutes. Mm -hmm. Now, if that's something else new that you want to enter for this 
go around, and I think, you know, of course, Dr. Penix can speak to that, but if you want to enter that as something that is new to this board meeting, I think that that's different. But at that time, I had the email that said otherwise. Okay, I'd like that entered into the records, please. Do you have a copy uh, of that? I think, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll I think they, that goes back to an issue we had once before. When a meeting has occurred, whatever's occurred in that meeting is what is recorded in the minutes. So minutes will stand accurate. And if you want to, at this meeting, like uh, Dr. Petrick said, enter that as a, an item that you uh, disagree with that, you can enter that into the minutes for this meeting. Okay. Okay, now uh, back to our motion. Uh, this is called the move to approve the minutes for November the 10th and 16th. Do we have a second to that motion? Mr. Berry second already. Mr. Mr. Berry seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, like sign? Aye. Okay, uh, then the vote is uh, it's, uh, four in favor of approving the minutes for November 5th and 16th, and we have one no vote. Madam Secretary, let the record reflect that uh, board members Barry, Amick, Kaufman, and Penix voted in favor of the motion, and Mr. Bruce voted uh, in, uh, in the negative. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, item four of this evening's agenda is uh, recognition, or uh, recognitions that we do not have in this evening. Item five, discussion items and presentation. The first one is uh, item A, update on the 2021 student enrollment, Mr. Hanshaw. And I believe you received the handout electronically with regards to student enrollment. Uh, we've had some time to look over uh, that's every <coughs> submission we've done for October the 1st so I just there's a whole lot of uh, and, and the long game short for uh, this school year and this has not been verified by the Department of Education but is our estimate that we have um, lost approximately 146 students out of our school system this year with our, uh, our head count enrollment is at um, 3,637. And there's a whole lot more in there. Uh, I know there's, it's a lot to digest in this submission. Uh, there's so much, so I may have to refer to some other folks because there's a lot of directors are involved in this submission. All the principals have went through and, and verified that their school is correct in their submissions. Have any questions? Uh, is that, Chris, is your number the same as this? Is it this walk from the road? That is, yep, 22, yes, yes it is. But the total down there was different. Our October one, sorry, is 3,471. I was looking at a different one. So yeah, that's our that's our head count member. Um, so some students, if they're three years old, uh, then they won't get counted as one full person for FTE. So that's why there's a discrepancy between head count and um, full time enrollment. So your your, F, your full time enrollment submission was 3,430.760. Would you repeat that? Um, Three thousand four hundred thirty point seven six zero, and that's just our submission. So they'll take all of our students and make sure they're not enrolled in other counties. And if they are, they'll figure out where the origin of that student was on October first. And so that number may go up or down by a few. It just depends on the state certification. Uh, again, Chris, you said that number was three thousand four hundred thirty point six seven. Yes, that's our. That was our FTE submission. Okay. Which which form says that? Uh, the second page. If you look at the first one, it says 2020 October headcount. On the second page, it says FTE submission. And the bottom right of that um, is our total. 346. 
I'm not seeing the same number you were putting This got through 3471. I may not have printed off. That's your head count. So on the second page, 3430.76. Oh, okay. There's all kinds of other um, things in there as well. Some of it's kind of small, but uh, we have, you know, county certification for CTE course enrollment, all kinds of things. This is what gets submitted to our state. That's not that's um, that's how they withdraw. So that by withdrawal, what we need to look at is all the way go all the way to the bottom, um, Mr. Berry, and you'll see head count at the top of an Excel spreadsheet with percentages out to the right hand side, and that tells you what percentage of the schools came or left. Um, so FTE was. Um, Mount Nebo grew by 14%. That was the biggest. And Richard Middle lost the most. They lost 16% of their students. Um, that's 36 kids. By FTE. Is that because they're like distance learning or? Um, no, this has nothing to do with distance learning. If they're if they're remote or distance learning, then they're still counted toward these schools. But if they're homeschooled, then they do leave. Um, basically, from the numbers, uh, the trends over the last years, I think a lot of their students are transferring into Summersville Middle School. They only lost five students this year compared to Before that was when Dr. Butcher was here. I think we had about 120 students leave. Yeah, there, there was a couple of years we had 125 one year and 126 the previous year, but that's been, I'm not sure which superintendent was here at that time, but this has been the largest for probably since I've been here. Uh, yeah, since I've been here. Years. I think we've averaged anywhere, we averaged 60, 70 since I've been here. Yeah. yeah. So this is, this is a huge. Draw. Uh, to what do you attribute it primarily? Um, uh, well, we've been declining a lot. I think, uh, I don't know, is Miss Gregory here? I don't think our homeschools really had a, a large uptick, has it? Yes, this year homeschool. Homeschool really did, and pipeliners leaving as well. Yeah. Both those things together. I, I said I've been expecting this for a couple of years. I knew it was, I could figure up last year we lost 60 or 70 kids through normal people just leaving. And I could, 
I could count about 50 kids last year that I thought we might lose this year just because the pipeline left, and it was it was true. So I think between normal attrition of people leaving and uh, pipeliners leaving and then the virus, that's just came to bed, you know, kind of bad for us. Mr. Henshaw, the uh, State Department will finalize this when? I'll uh, ask Mr. Hess then. When do, it should be pretty soon. Well, you sent the certification in. Uh, they'll, they will uh, start developing the comps for next year uh, around December 15th. So they're, they're accumulating all the data now. So we'll, we'll know some, some preliminary numbers here in the next couple of weeks probably. instructional materials, textbooks, resources for um, particular subjects. Um, after the new year, we're going to be evaluating and reviewing new English language arts and reading materials for K through 12 for an implementation beginning in the fall of 2021. And since this was the last year of our current adoption, we decided to purchase one year of actively learn for grades 6 through 12 as an experiment to see if it might be and might meet our needs for the next adoption. Um, I kind of became aware of Actively Learn at a conference when, we, when they had them, you know, when we used to be able to go to conferences um, about a year ago. And w at the presentation, I was really impressed with its capacity for engaging students. It's a completely digital platform that can be used not only in ELA, but also in social studies and science. And it kind of this year, it's bridged that gap between students who are face-to-face -face and who are distance learners. And we're here this evening, and we're going to give you an update about the progress with using Actively Learn. Um, we have some people who are going to do some presentations for you. It'll probably take about 30 minutes. Um, first, we have Leslie Boffman and Samantha Murphy. There are traveling TISSs uh, who serve the secondary schools. They're in more schools than just the secondary schools. but. Samantha is a previous ELA high school teacher, and Leslie is a previous middle school special education teacher. And they both have a lot of credibility with working with our, our secondary teachers. Um, they have a lot of experience working in secondary classrooms. They're going to share what a lesson component looks like, the supports that are built into the system for students, and the technical advantages of an all-digital platform. Uh, with this program, we don't purchase any textbooks. Um, so the students don't have to keep up with them, they don't have to carry them around from class to class, and it also includes a full digital independent library, um, and that's really important right now since none of our secondary schools have any physical libraries anymore. So they're going to share with you what it looks like, and then we have a couple teachers that are going to speak to the use of it, and then we're going to have um, Sarah Lee um, share the progress from the built-in assessment that it comes with. So, Samantha and Leslie. showing two different things, so I'm going to push this TV back a little bit and let's see you guys can see better.
This one? No, the other one. That one doesn't tell. Oh, I don't tell. Okay. Well, can you shove that one back a little bit more? <laughs> I can't see the end. Okay. 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 Um, I'm Samantha Murphy, and I am the technology integration specialist for nine schools in our county. Um, I provide services to Mount Nebo Elementary, Mount Lookout Elementary, Glade Creek Elementary, uh, Richwood High School, Richwood Middle School, Nicholas County High School. Summersville Middle School, um, the Career Center, the Votech, did I miss any? Oh, uh, the, the, oh, yeah, the Learning Center, um, I think that's it. Mm -hmm. And today I'm going to show you the teacher side of actively learn. So if you look over here on the TV to your right, this is what the teacher dashboard um, looks like. And I'm Leslie Boffman. I'm the Technology Integration Specialist for eight different schools. Um, I share all the secondary schools with Samantha, and then I have Panther Creek Elementary and Cherry River Elementary, are my elementary schools. Um, my side is I'm going to show you on the student side and show you some of the interactive things that it shows um, from, that, from the student perspective. And we figured out a way for the um, teachers to use this offline and online, so it, it brings um, both perspectives for the kiddos, so they can send it out on schoolworks with PDFs and those type of things, but if they have internet access, then they can use it online. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started with the teacher dashboard, um, but I wanna show you something first, and uh, Dr. Penix, you're not gonna be able to see my screen because we can only share one screen at a time, so you're looking at the student view right now, but I'm gonna talk through what I'm showing them, so hopefully you'll kind of get an idea. Um, That's fine. Okay. <laughs> so one of the things that Actively Learn uh, showed us whenever we started looking into them um, was the, their uh, collection. And I know one of the things, and I understand you know, what, it happened, what had happened and why, why we lost our libraries, um, but at the same time, you know, I was heartbroken when that happened. But something that Actively Learn offers us that I don't think any other program does is it gives us a library. And that offers our students over 18,000 pieces of text. So anywhere from the classics from like Charles Dickens all the way up to newer titles that are you know, current and uh, you know, YA titles like um, Orbiting Jupiter that are high interest books to nonfiction texts and uh, primary documents, a little bit of everything. So that was something that was a big plus. So right now, what you're seeing on um, the screen over here was the spreadsheet that they sent to us. Um, and I just wanted to show you that, not to go through everything, you know, all 18,000 uh, different titles, but just to kind of give you an idea of, of how, um, how exciting this was to, for me as an ELA teacher with a, um, a library media background. Okay, so let's go back. Oh yeah, you want to show them on your side? Yeah. So this, this is actually where they can find the text. They have a catalog and they can search. Um, and then they also can do a reading log. Once they have read it, um, this is their independent reading log. So they can come here and see, oh yes, I've read that, but no, I have not read that. So they can actually go through the catalog here. And there's where books, there's Peter Pan, the Invisible Man, Secret Garden. They can check these out um, or read these at any time. They don't have to have the teacher assign these to them. I'm sorry, is that microphone working? I, I'm, um, you know, with these masks, I'm yes. having trouble hearing. Uh, I don't think it is. Is it on? Uh, I don't know. It's on the bottom. The very uh, bottom. They got the deaf guy over here as far away as they can get him. <laughs> <laughs> showing on the left hand screen and that Gus can see, these are the library books that the students can read at any time. And another benefit to this is, you know, whenever you have, uh, as a teacher, if you have a classroom set of books, like 25 books or whatever, you know, you can have 25 kids read that. But if you want to, um, you have unlimited access. So if you had a student who wanted to read like Aesop's Fables and you had somebody else who wanted to read The Call of the Wild, like you could have five of them reading one book and six of them reading a different book, like you're not limited to the number. Or if you wanted 
Like say you had, uh, you taught high school and you teach 120 some students a day and you need them all to read um, a Christmas carol, they can all be reading a Christmas carol. There's not a limit or copyright that you have to worry about as far as that is concerned. Okay, um, also uh, what Mr. Nichols was saying is if we um, go with this for our adoption for ELA, we also get the social studies and the science content. And to uh, navigate to that, if you see over here that, that little blinky light right there, the two masks, yeah, you don't care. Um, that means that I'm in ELA mode. So I'm seeing all the content for English language arts at this time. But if I hit the drop down arrow, I can switch and toggle it between science, which is the microscope. <coughs> so that's all my science content coming up there. Or I can go to social studies. And so this all ties together. So as an ELA teacher, I actually have access to you know, texts that might be more science-based or you know, government-based, um, social studies, that sort of thing. So I'm going to switch back to ELA. And something that, that's really neat about this dashboard is they always have like a featured article. And that's the big article you see here at the top with the two people looking at each other. And then um, underneath it, you have all your current events, all your um, up-to-date uh, uh, articles and uh, things that are going on in the world. Like when, when we had the election, there were a lot of um, articles about the election and politics and, and that sort of thing. So right now, you know, we're getting into the holiday season, so our high interest articles, you know, some of them have to do with, with the holidays. Um, and then we have popular high school assignments, we have a Christmas carol, because that's relevant for this time of year. But then we go all the way down to the bottom, and we have popular text sets, which, as a former, former ELA teacher, this really excited me, because I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, wow, I have my whole unit already pre-planned. And what that looks like is, if I wanted to go with the theme of identity, like right here, Here we go. Okay, I have all of these, all of this research already done for me, and all of these resources that are going to pop up. So all of these have to do with the theme of identity, and I just need to go through and pick which ones are going to be best for my students. So I have the option of looking at fiction and nonfiction, poetry, videos, um, you name it, and it's all based on that particular theme, which I thought that was really nice. Okay, also if you look at these, um, these cards for each, each assignment, if you look down at the bottom, it tells you how long the assignment is. So this article is two pages long. It gives me the grade level band right here, 6th to 10th grade, and then it even has the Lexile level right there. Um, and so if I uh, are, am using level set like our teachers are using, which is a, a, an assessment that assesses their Lexile uh, level, and I want to put you know, kids into certain different reading groups, and I want to search text based on you know, their, their, their reading level, I can do that. And the only thing I have to do is I can come up here to my search bar and go to all Lexiles, and I can search different levels or different um, reading levels. I can also uh, type in here uh, the name of a, an author or a type of a book or a theme, search that way. I can search by grade. And everything is West Virginia standards aligned. So if I know a standard that I know I really need to hit, like maybe I'm teaching ninth grade, I can click on that and here are all my standards. So I can search for uh, texts and assignments based on ELA 9.1 if I wanted to. So I thought that that was really nice. All right, now I'm going to go into, we, we made a demo class. And Mrs. Bachman here is my demo student that I created. And I, I made some comments for her. So one of the things that I can do in here is whenever I click on my roster, I have all of my all my students right here. Um, I can put them into groups if I want to. I can tell when they last signed in, when they joined the class, 
And then this feature right here, if I click on that and put a check mark into extra help, they're going to get extra scaffolding. So they're going to get, like, you can type in footnotes and things of that nature that only those students will see. And nobody, none of the other kids will even know. Okay, do you want to? Are you going to show what your end, what it looks like as I'm doing my end? Yes, I'll do okay. it. So one thing that I like um, as a former special ed teacher, this will actually um, read the text to them if they're working online. So if I am um, working on this story and I need it read, I can tell it to read. And it highlights the words, of course it's not going to do so because I'm on the team meeting. But it highlights the words as it's reading that word to them. So it actually gives them the visual of what the word is, but it's then they get the auditory of it being read to them. You can speed it up, slow it down, um, do several different things with that. Um, and then you can actually change text size. Um, you can change the background for visually impaired students. That's important. Um, it's easier for them to see certain colors, um, with certain size of text, and those type of things. Our dyslexic students, you can actually use the dyslexic settings, and it makes it a little bit easier for them to read. Um, it gives a little bit more spacing between the letters and the lines, so they can actually read that um, better. Um, as they go along, they it, it actually stops them. Um, so I've I've started this. Um, article and if I don't know what a word is like if I don't know what neighborhood is I can actually click on it and I can have it defined for me so that tells me over here what a neighborhood is but then on the teacher side it will show um, that I have looked up that word um, and that way I'm gonna refresh it so you can see so on my I'm in the same assignment she's in and I can see which words that she's looking up. So like if I wanted to gear my vocabulary mm -hmm. instruction towards those words that the kids are struggling with, then I know which words they're looking up exactly. and how many times they've looked them up. So like over on the, on the right side here, this is my class data. Um, I can tell that Leslie has spent four minutes mm -hmm. In this assignment, we were in here earlier today playing around too, so that's added in. Um, I can tell that she's looked up three vocabulary words. Um, and then as she completes the questions and the polls and everything, all of the um, information comes down here. And I can click on her name and just see the answers that she's showing me, or that she's giving me. So I can tell that she, when they ask her how often do you dance, for the full question, she said all the time. And then if she takes any notes, which is part of our um, post reading strategies, if she starts annotating the article, then all I have to do is hit a button and I can see all the notes that she's taken for that article. So I can highlight it and take a note and say, you know. Well, does the student control this board in any way? Or this is, is the it? student end that I'm on right now. That's uh, that's under exactly their control. The that's, that's under their control. Mm -hmm. Okay. So right now it's showing no notes, but she's she's typing something. So, so I hit save. Okay. And then I highlighted student, and then I said, "What is the definition?" Okay. So and then I can see that she had a question. So that's just an example. The thing that I like um, is students can read, 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 read. And then it actually stops them, and they have to answer the question before they can go on any further. Um, this tells them what the depth of knowledge is for this question. Um, and it also um, will tell them whether they got the question right or wrong as soon as they answer it. So hit submit, and then it says instantaneous feedback. I got that incorrect. And you can actually give the students um, multiple opportunities. So, um, and then, now that I've answered that question, I can go on. Um, what else do we want to highlight? Oh, and then, you can also see that it does have um, YouTube videos that are embedded into the curriculum. Um, like this one is a Ring Around the Rosie video, and they can, the students can watch this. 
Yeah, and it's, it's pretty much the same format as the text. Like, you can only read so far and you have to answer a question or, or yes. something like that. Well, it's the same thing with the video. The video won't let the kids move on to the next part of the video until they answer a question. Exactly. It stops the video and lets it, makes them answer a question. Now, are we, are we using this now? Yes. Yes. We've purchased one year. And the students are involved in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are they responding pretty well? My son, I have an eighth grader. He loves it. Um, he, we actually got a free version of it last year um, when we closed down, and that's what I had him using for his ELA curriculum. Um, he worked with his ELA teacher, but I had him using this, and he he absolutely loved it. And and he likes how it, you know, breaks it down into parts, and you know, it it worked really well for us. Yeah. So. Yeah, and like uh, what Leslie and Mr. Nichols said, um, even though it is like a web-based program, um, you can attach it, you can convert it to a PDF. So like any of the text um, that they want to use, if they want to convert it to, a, the teacher wants to convert it to a PDF and attach it to school, then those children who have limited internet access can use it. And the company also told us that they're working on an app right now that will help us with those kids. I, I think what is good about it, it, of course there's a lot of probably, probably good things about it, but kids can get involved, they can yes. decide what to do or decide not to do that. Absolutely. It's not just put before them and, you know, that's it. And, and they can see, if you have it turned on on the teacher end, they can see what their peers have answered as well, so they can have class discussions um, with that. You know, they, my son was showing me one of us, one of his assignments, and some of the kids were not answering correctly. And I said, "I hope that you're not. <laughs> I hope you're answering correctly." He said, "I am, mom." So it was, but the teacher would, if they didn't answer, you know, if they didn't answer up to her criteria, she would send it back to them and say, "Try this again," which is really good because then it's not, you know, just right or wrong. It's try this right. again and look, look over more, what you get. Have more involvement. Exactly. Yes, yes, and the differentiation as far as that goes. You know, you can um, sort it by reading level, group the kids in whatever groups you, you want to group them in. And so you can tailor it a lot easier to uh, students of different ability levels mm -hmm. and, and interest levels, too. So if you have kids that are you know, really into science and you want to you wanna do reading groups and have them read something that's more science-based, you can do that. Uh, the students have also have access to um, what they have received as a grade on that particular assignment, but then they can also see, let me go back to grades. Uh, so this is what I have received, I have a zero percent so far, but I've only answered 33 percent of that. So they can see their grades in real time, and then they can also see their data. So let me see if I can zoom in just a little bit. Uh, this, is, this is on the student end. Oh, no. So if I go to my data, this is, they can see this. So I can see that I'm reading too fast and that I have a grade that's below basic. So they know that they need to slow down, but they can also see how many vocab lookups they have, the text-to-speech, translations, I've written one note. Um, but they can sort of correct themselves as well. Um, they can also use the research project. Um, they can, if they're working on something that's web-based and they need to house a bunch of different websites, uh, they can actually add content. Um, they can do it as a Google Doc, a PDF, or an in internet article. You can import it, just paste the URL there, and then it houses it in this location for them. Because some of them, you know, especially like seniors, they have that research project. They can house all of their research right here. And teachers have that option too. So if they have something um, that they've used before that they want to convert into an actively learn assignment, they have the ability to upload that to actively learn. Be it um, some, like a, something that's text-based or a video or, or whatever that may be. Okay. So we have. Um, do you want to present? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, in in science. Are they able to go back and study uh, previous information uh, well, to prepare for a test? And 
We have a science teacher with us that's going to tell us some more because she uses it in her classroom. Oh, okay. And there are virtual science experiments too that go does, with does it. Does this depend on internet access? Some of it, some of yeah. Is it most applicable in the classroom, or can it also be used in remote learning? Are they both about the same? Or? Um, on the science aspect, uh, like the example that I have here today, uh, this one is just an article. So this one is one that I could convert to a PDF and they can do it at home without internet access. Um, they do have a lot of the FET simulations. And I don't know if you've worked with the FET simulations before, but I've used them, and one of the good things is they're iPad um, compatible, and a lot of the previous simulations that I've used are not. So that would be an instance where they couldn't do that one at home without internet. So that's something I, I couldn't assign unless we were in the classroom. But, um, but I'm Caitlin uh, Piat, and I teach biology and earth and space science at Nicholas County High School. So Sam and Leslie had asked if I would come and kind of talk about my experience with actively learn so far and I told them um, I probably don't have a ton of experience with it yet but I do have a little bit I have used it a little bit here and this is one of the articles that I had assigned to my class um, this one is on acids and bases so the way that actively learns had kind of broken on my end broken it up was by content area and they do it by the next gen standards so I can look at the standards if I wanted to go that route. Uh, they also break it up by curriculum units, like they do in English, but they focus more on you know, chemistry of life, um, genetics. So they follow the units pretty closely to how my textbook follows it. So I can kind of go with that flow and keep it in that order. And they're already grouped for me. Um, I can search them. So this one, like I said, is an article so we could do it online, and it has questions. So they could come here. Using the figure above, which substance would you expect to have the highest concentration of hydronium ions? So if they read through all this, and they look right here at this little pH scale, then they could guess, or they could actually read through it and try to figure it out. So I'm just going to pick one because I'm not reading through it. But if I hit submit, I got it. Oh, well, that was a good guess on my part. <laughs> It's like you teach this. But uh, it'll tell me if it's correct. So this one's a multiple choice option. Um, the multiple choice options will go ahead and give me feedback right away. And then it'll let me continue on to the next section. Uh, this one's which quality is one of the defining traits of acids. So uh, once again, I'm just randomly picking one. So this one was incorrect, but that's what I was hoping. So on my end here, it highlights what answers were correct. And this one was a multiple answers, but it still lets me move on. So I could go back through. This one's an open-ended question, so it's one that I later would have to go back through and grade, so they're not going to get feedback. But on my end, I can mark it as proficient. Um, I can mark it as below level. I could mark it, if it's anything, like basic and below, um, and ask them to redo it. So if it's not up to my standards, then they can redo the answer, and then I can go back through and regrade it. So it's not just automatically, you know, you got it wrong. I'm not going to give you another chance. What are you um, going to do about labs? Do what? What What are you going to do about labs? Labs. Laboratory. Experiment. Well, I have done a couple lab labs myself with lab demonstrations, and then had them answer. This one. I can go in, like they said, and make my own content. Yeah, assign her a lab. Yeah. Or assign me a lab. So or I've gone through and um, done a couple. I haven't got to assign them here. I've just assigned them through schoolwork. But I've uploaded videos of myself doing the labs and going over it with them. Having I give them the data sheet, and they watch everything I do. And then, yeah, one of these would be fine. Um, I'll try this one. So these FET simulations are really good to use. Design, right? And demo class. Mm -hmm. And then she assigned it so it popped up on so my she end. can see it. This is my teacher view. So these ones work, like I said, pretty well to take place of some labs. They give me assignment directions here on each question. So 
So this I have to answer before yes, I can so go Yes, so this on. one gives you a question. Um, you have to answer the question before you can move on. This is the lab. There's no hands-on. This, with this version, no. This is just. Um, is there any version that has any hands-on? This, you can actually, like, I can move. Yeah, you can do some things with it. I mean, it's not going to take the place of a hands -on. an actual lab, and you know that's the downside too with me just doing my demonstrations like I do. They're not getting to do it. I do um, supply them with it, so some of them are things that they could do at home if they're very simple labs, um, like I do one with water properties, they can easily do it at home. And I tell them, you know, I encourage them, go ahead and try it if you can. If you have the material, if you're able to, I'd love to see you do it. And, and I hope we brought that, because this is probably about the closest we can get. All yeah, the time, so. uh, simulations so far have been about all I can do. Um, I can have one, one student at a lab table, and I have six lab tables and classes of 20 plus students. So the chance for them to do one in class at the moment is very low and they know that. And I need it because that's my favorite part of science too. This, um, I have had some students that they do tell me they like these. I've had some that tell me they don't. Um, I've got high schoolers, they're creatures of habit. They're not always very accepting of some of the technology integration that I put into it. How does, they pop up with notes for her too. how does the price compare to standard textbooks? Do you have any idea? I, that would be it's about the same. Um, I think we heard, we purchased this one I think for sixty three thousand. I think it was yeah, for all four secondary schools. Mm -hmm. And you know when you buy a textbook that's one hundred fifty dollars piece, it, it averages out to about the same. But we don't buy a textbook for every student when we have it. No, so that's, that's about the same as a classroom set of textbooks. Uh, the textbooks for each student. Right, and it's three different content areas too, plus the 18,000 uh, text um, options that the kids have, the novels and the um, other things like that. Are all students using this program right now? Many of them are. Um, I think content-wise, ELA is really pushing it the most. Um, some of us other content, I think science-wise, I might be the only one at the high school that's using it right now. Um, just because we have recently had a couple trainings on them. So I'm the youngest. I'm usually more willing to try the technology than they are. And, and they'll tell me that. So I've kind of helped them with some of them, and I think they do plan on using them. Um, I think Miss Bennett had used it in the spring when we got the demo for a little bit. And she liked it. And I mean, I think if we all feel confident using it, then it's a good purchase. And we also have an ELA teacher to, to talk to you guys mm -hmm. as well. So. Yeah. And with the, the book catalog, I didn't realize it was there till this morning when you guys asked me to find um, what, whichever one of these I wanted to show. And I thought it was pretty nice that there are science content books um, that are interesting for students to read. So, for example, one of them was one that I had been talking with one of the math teachers about, and it's um, Born to Run, and so it was about a tribe in Mexico that genetically they're able to run better than others, and it kind of talks about why and gets into the science of it, and that was something that he had been recommending to a student, actually, and now I can go back and tell that student, hey, I found this book, you can read it, you don't have to buy it, or you know, go to the library and get it, you have access to it on, on your iPad. Now, when, they get, when we get back in regular class, mm -hmm. you'll still use this as your teaching tool, main teaching tool? No, I, I do not use this one as my main tool. Um, I use this one kind of as a supplement so far, I haven't used it as a, you have to do this type of activity, like for the acid and base stuff. That was something my students were really struggling with. So I put up, I think, three or four different lessons on acids and bases, and then they were able to go through. Um, some of them told me that it helped them a lot because it presented it in a much easier way to read than the textbook would, kind of a little bit more entertaining. So they liked that. Um, 
Some of them, of course, they told me straight out. I just answered the questions and moved on. But they're high schoolers. I get that. But it also <laughs> provides your accommodation for your specialist. It does, and I, I can differentiate it. Um, you know, I was always a, a pretty <clears throat> high student, so for me, I think one of the hardest things about teaching was realizing that not every student gets that at the same level. So me reading through my high school textbook, I could say, okay, yeah, this makes sense. Not every student reading through the textbook is going to get that. <clears throat> and so with the level set that paired with this, being able to see what their reading level actually is, sometimes I'll look at it and I'll be like, oh, well, this says it's a first sixth grade student. That's too low for them. But really, for some of them, it's not. They would really benefit from that. And this has helped me be able to see what students really need that low or that high of an area. Anything else? I think Helena is already on the Yes, she is. She's up here, so we can turn over to Melinda. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Melinda, are you there? Let me stop sharing my screen. I'm here. Are you ready? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Um, I'm Melinda Bennett. I teach uh, sixth grade ELA at Richmond Middle. Um, our sixth grade standards are really heavy on informational text. And um, so, I mean, that's one reason I really love Actively Learn because they have all those um, current events articles, really high interest, engaging articles for my kids to read. And we all know that half the battle is getting kids interested in what they're reading. So my kids love this um, because they always have new updates with, uh, like I said, new current events popping up at least every week. Sometimes I think it's more often than that. Um, we also really focus on strategies for reading informational text and strategies for reading literary text, um, like highlighting, taking notes, uh, looking up words that we don't know whenever we read, and all this is built into actively learn. So the kids really get into it. Um, I get that automatic data and actively learn so I can see how long uh, it's taking my kids to read the articles. Um, are they flying through it? Are they really digging into the text and looking up those words? Or are they just kind of, you know, rushing through it to get done? So um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were reading an article about uh, Katherine Johnson, a biography on Katherine Johnson, and um, whenever I looked, my kids were reading way too fast. They were flying through, and so I was able to go back, have them retry the assignments, and say, hey, you need to spend a little bit more time on this, uh, and I could see that automatically, even though they're remote and they're not sitting right in front of me, so it was really, really helpful, so um, I love it. I really hope we get to keep it. Um, it just, it has uh, a lot of different kinds of texts on there that I can use and the Lexile level. Um, you know, we took the level set assessment in the beginning of the year. I got to see what my kids' Lexile scores are and I can match texts to them based on that. Um, so I can really uh, zone in on individual student needs, uh, which we all know is really important. Okay. Do you guys have any questions for Melinda? How much training does this take? Uh, how much training does this take? Um, um, how much extra work is this going to be on teachers? If it? it really hasn't been a ton of extra work. Um, we've had well, probably three or four different trainings. Right. Um, but and a lot of that was on level set, which is the assessment um, that we were given to, or that we gave to the students. So, you know, we we had to have a little bit extra on that, but the teachers, they have really they embraced it. They it up and yeah. run room with it. Yeah. And, you know, from time to time, we'll have some questions, and then, you know, Mrs. Boffin and I will we'll go in, and, and we'll, we'll say, okay, how do I get to this, and we'll, and we'll show them. But for the most part, it's really user-friendly, um, and it's very intuitive, too. Like, you think, oh, I'm going to find this, and your, your search bar is, like, right up there, you know. So, it's it's pretty easy to use. And customer service has been phenomenal. Yes. The trainings that they've had have been online because of COVID, but we have the same trainer every time. And she's our great. Yeah, she has shared her email and her contact number mm -hmm. with all of our teachers, so if they get stuck on whatever it is they're trying to do, 
If they can't get a hold of one of these ladies, they can call her directly, and she is Johnny on the spot with an answer. Mm -hmm. Yes, usually within an hour. We usually hear back mm -hmm. via email. And I've, I've texted her, and she's gotten back to me almost immediately. So It's been a blessing. We've had the iPads for sure. Absolutely. Because, you know, we have classroom sets of textbooks. Being able to move this way forward, and, you know, students learn digitally. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really been a blessing, so finding these resources. Um, and then I saw the standards, so those are West Virginia standards mm -hmm. that students are able to actually click on and go through. And, uh, and I forgot to mention, the standards are available for the students as well. So it's not just the teachers that see the standards. The students can actually, see, it says at the top of their question, it says um, standards, and it has, like one of my saw it said two standards, and if they click on it, they can see what standards. And, and all of that's tied to data, too. So, like, if when they're answering a question and it's aligned to, like, 9.1. whatever, then however they're answering, the teacher is getting data and charts and graphs based upon are her students mastering the standards or are they not mastering the standards? Where, where, are, where are they? So if they need to move on and try something more difficult or if they need to go back and reteach, I mean, it's, it's, it's there. I think it looks great. Again, we had textbooks, classroom sets of textbooks. We've been trying to move forward. Thankfully, we're ahead of the curve. We were able to supply every one of our students with an iPad, mm -hmm. now with online resources. And we've also found a way to start picking up iPads for those and taking them to the schools to get uploads and downloads done to help with, with that. So we're getting there. Mm -hmm. Good, good job. Thank you. Thank well, you. as you heard these ladies mention, there were a few times you heard the word level set, and that's where I come into to play. But what that level set is, is it's an assessment package that's part of this Actively Learn purchase. But what it does is it uses a closed style assessment to give the um, teachers a Lexile level for those kids. And Lexiles have been around for a long time. Leslie, if you'll go to the next slide, they can see. Oh gosh, probably 15 years ago at least our state got started getting on board with Lexiles. And what that is, is it's a literacy range or a reading level um, that those teachers will get for each kiddo. And that's just a little chart to refresh your memory if you haven't seen that in a while. But basically what they do is they give you a grade span number and say, okay, if you are in the third grade, you should be able to read text that's limited or within 415 to 760 Lexile levels. That's the typical grade range. So when these teachers uh, give these kids these quick little assessments, they get a specific number. And what typically the guidance is, is that you are trying to match kids within 50 of their Lexile range. So you can drop down or go above, but basically you're trying to match that text to the reader. Okay, go ahead and go to the next one. So what we did this October was we administered the level set assessment to as many of our kiddos as we could. Um, the first week, we asked teachers to do their in-person, their face-to-face -face kids, to, so we could get our feet wet, because we'd never given this assessment. We didn't know how it was going to go. Kids had never seen it. So we jumped into that, and then after that, we said, okay, in the next couple weeks, if you have a digital learner who has internet access, go ahead and let them give it a try. So we have not tested everybody, because we do have some kiddos that don't have internet, but we were able to test 1,276 of our secondary students. Our average Lexile came back as a 1013. Well, what's 1013 mean? On that previous chart, that would put us in the middle of that eighth grade band. And then what level set does is they also, if you'll take one of these and pass them around, they break your results into four categories. So you'll see it's pretty small on that slide, but the first column is falls far below. The second column is approaches. Then the third column is meets, and the last column is exceeds. So what they've done here is they've charted out our student results based on where they would be typically, or what their targeted point would be. They consider those two columns on the left not on track. So if your kids are far below, those are the kids we really need to, to panic about or approaching. They're not quite to that grade level expectation, but they're really close. We can move them there. And then the on tracks are for our kiddos that meet or exceed. And we see we do have several kiddos who exceed our standards, but of course I would 
uh, much prefer to see that last column be as tall as the first column, and the first column as short as the last one. So that's our goal. We'll get those flipped around. Okay, we broke down our data once again. We looked at it by grade level to see about where we were, looking at the percentage of kiddos that tested. And you'll see sixth grade had the most percentage of our kiddos tested. Um, it gives you the number or the lexile, and you see the letter L after it. So, for example, 923 L, or 923 lexile, would be what their goal would be right now as a sixth grader if they were, were to be on track for college and career ready. So if we, if we are going to let them exit us, being college and career ready with their le, uh, literacy level or their reading level, that would be where we would like them to be at sixth grade at this point. And in October when we assessed, we had 17% of our kids there. So we've got some work to do when you look, oops, sorry. Back up, oops. got some work to do when we look at that chart, however, uh, the guidance I was given when we started talking about administering level set from, from the company itself and from some other districts that have used it were don't panic when you see your first results because they are going to be the lowest you'll ever see. But of course, your kids have never taken this test, they don't know the software, and they've probably not had that expectation. So now we'll be able to move forward. Okay, go to the next one, Leslie. Then we broke it apart by school, and we'll just quickly let you have a peek at that. You'll see Nicholas County High School was able to test 416 students, roughly about 100 in each of the class. And you'll see a bulk of their kiddos landed in the approaches category. And what's the number on that? Because I can't see that because I'm blind. Approaches 166. Yeah, 166. What's a lexile? It's like a, it's considerable to a reading level. And how's it determined? Um, with this assessment, it's a closed style assessment. So they're, they're reading a passage. There will be uh, certain words that are removed. And then the, cur the kids will use um, some multiple choice type answers to fix, figure out what would go in there. And this particular test is for ELA? Well, it, it gives them an, a, the reading level. We actually chose to administer it during social studies class because all of the kids have social studies class. Um, but yes, and then these are the results when those teachers get those reading levels, like you heard both of them mention, I can put kids in groups, I can assign text based on this level. The average level at Nicholas County High School for those four years turned out to be a 1034. So do you try to assign levels a little above what they tested at? Typically to Rather see growth, you want to stay 50 below 50 or 50 100 is the typical range. Now, you can assign them higher than that, but as the teacher, you better be prepared with some of those scaffolds like Samantha was talking about, pointing out those vocabulary words, asking those clarifying questions. Because some of that content, you know, is something they have to have, like with science, it's going to be hard. But the teacher can look at that and say, okay, this article was written on a 1200 lexile. My kiddos are averaging a thousand lexile, what am I going to do to support them so that they can interact with that? And that's where she may have to do some pre-teaching, do some background building, vocabulary development. Yeah, they try to go things. above that. Right, to try to get above them. Okay, let's get the next school. Richwood High School had 229 kiddos tested, averaged about 60 per grade level. Their average lexile was 956, so it's very comparable. Um, when we look at their graph, their tallest bars are in the fall of bars below and approaching. So we've got some work to do there to get that shifted over to either meeting or exceeding so that they are on track for being college and career ready with their reading level when they leave. Leslie, would you read those four numbers across the bottom yes, of those bars? Falls far below is 84. Approaches is 82, meets 54, and exceeds 9. Okay, next school. Richwood Middle, we had 173 students tested, roughly about 55 in each grade level, roughly. 
Um, their average Lexile was a 736. And you see here, the first two columns as well are going to be where we're really going to have to do some work. We have, can we read them? Yep. <laughs> Falls below is 49, approaches is 102, meets 15, and exceeds 7. Okay, and Summersville Medal, 408 students tested with an average Lexile of 801. Now, the chart that I've given you basically breaks down what each of those ranges would be. So, for example, if I were teaching at Summersville Middle School and I had a kiddo whose score came back as 801, I'd have to first determine which grade level it is that I'm teaching. So, for example, if I am teaching sixth grade and I follow it across and I look to see where 801 would be, I would see that kiddo is basically in the middle of approaching because 920 would be what they would have to score to get ready to move to the next column. So I know that that kiddo is going to need a little bit of support. They're not quite to grade level yet. Does that make sense? Okay. But then at the same time, if I happen to have an idea of where that kid falls, then I can say, okay, you're at 910, for example, with my kid. You are this close to being on grade level. That's where I have that talk with those kids and say, this next time you assess, I bet like we can get you over that line. Now, what can you do as a, kid, as a student to help yourself get there? And that's where linking back to where she showed you that the kid has access well, are you reading slowly and carefully? Are you doing your best? Those types of things so that the kids are actually making the decision board. Oh, yeah, I'm not looking up very many vocabulary words to make sure I know what these mean. I am reading a little bit fast. And that's where the teacher can start having those kind of data talks with their kids and say, what can you do to help yourself? Does that make sense? That's how that chart works. Now, the teachers get a report for every kid they have. They can see exactly what their individual kid's score was. He also had asked the principals, since this assessment was right before report card time, they can also print an individual student results where each kid could take that letter home with their report card. So their parents should have a record of, okay, here my kid tested in October and this is where they were. This is designed to be almost like a little uh, temperature check. So they took it in October. Lord willing, we'll do it again at the end of January so the kids can start to say, am I getting better? What we've typically found in years past is we've had no way of measuring are our kids growing until we get to that test at the end of the year. This is going to be a tool that's going to allow our teachers to see are our kids moving forward with their reading ability, which we've not always, you know, we've never had anything in the recent history to be able to do that as a progress monitoring tool. So I think our teachers are really excited with that. Okay, next slide. And then the next thing is exactly what's going to happen next. Um, actually, the first one's already been checked off. The teachers were trained a couple weeks ago on how to take those Lexile levels and build some small groups in your class to be able to assign kids based on what they need. Um, our TISAs, of course, are co-teaching alongside these guys, answering questions, modeling lessons, so that we can get our feet wet and try this out. And then, of course, the students will reassess in late January, and then we'll see where we are again. Do you think this helps kids teaching them how to take a test? Um, I think it's, it's practice with taking a test. It's a pretty short assessment. It takes about 20 minutes, so it's not labor intensive. But I think it will give them a good um, opportunity for buy-in in the fact that they're going to be able to start monitoring their own growth. Because when it first happened, some of the kids weren't quite sure why they were taking this test. You know, we quickly explained it to them. There was a little welcome video, but they were kind of like, okay, you need a reading level, what for? But I think as that becomes um, part of the way we operate and we look here and say, okay, here's your reading level, this is what you, you need to get. Since this is a national with Lexiles and Metametrics, so many things out there in the world will give you a Lexile level. Like when you go on these websites um, that are like career opportunities or they're looking at CFWV and, you know, looking at, okay, I want to be a vet. Well, it will say, 
you need a lexile level of blank to be a vet. Well, we never had the opportunity to help our kids work toward that. Because the only time we ever got a lexile for our kids was on that state summative assessment, which was one time a year. And by the time we got the results back, guess what? They were already in the next grade. Yeah, I, I, would, I would imagine that before you had this, 95% of them, or 99 maybe, didn't know what a lexile level was. Right. But, but yet they were supposed to have one. Right. And, and so we're getting there. The language is getting out. The kids are being made aware. Kids and families and teachers. That's a good explanation. When they took their assessment tests before, like when they would take them, like some in the fall, some in the spring, did they take them on computer or were they paper tests? Most recently they've been on computer. So they should be a little bit familiar with taking yeah. a test on the computer. Yeah. This was just a different landing page and a little bit different form. A little more reading intensive. Any other questions? Uh, these are national standards. I'm oh, sorry. Yes. No, go ahead. Oh, I said so, uh, these are yes. national standards. Lexile right? is a national okay. norm, yes. And it's created by Metametrics, is the uh, research company behind them. And the whole purpose of all their research and whatnot is it's helping students be matched to text. And in the last, oh, probably decade, any textbook that you've purchased as a district has to have lexile measures for their passages. But the problem is, we've had the textbooks that have had these, you know, we'll read chapter seven and we know the lexile for it's 1200. We didn't know where the kids were at. So now we've got that missing piece. Dr. Lee, I would just like to say that uh, I really appreciate this. Uh, this, over the last couple of years, we've been asking about how we're doing formative assessment with our students. And this seems like a, a really good tool uh, in the English language arts area. And so I appreciate the fact that uh, we're doing something and we'll be able to look in January to see how much progress has been made. And then at the end, before we do the actual one time of year summative assessment. So uh, I appreciate you all doing this. And again, it's something we've been looking for over the last couple of years. Right. And I just want to add there, just remember, we want to think ELA a lot, but this is really about literacy, and our kids have to be good readers no matter what content they're going to do to be able to be successful from anything from math, social studies, to anything that's trade school. So it's not just, you know, kids going to college need to have that high reading level. It's not. It's anybody we graduate needs to be college and career ready. So this is a good measure for us. Any other questions for Dr. Lee? Thank you all very much. Appreciate that presentation. Uh, item 6A, approval of the contract with Kara Priest, uh, Care Coordinator. Mr. Nichols, are you present? Uh, yeah. Prior to COVID, we've I've had parent coordinators in every elementary school, but because of COVID, we didn't rehire those people. But Somersville Elementary has a project that they're doing with their library that they actually still have with Follett. So um, we were going to do a little five-day contract with Kara just so she can go in and get the computer system set up, get all of the books uh, cataloged and on file. So it's just a five-day contract just for her, for Somersville Elementary, so they can complete their Follett library project. What is the funding source for this, Mr. Uh, Title I. Title I, thank you. Any questions for Mr. Nichols? Item B is approval of the MOU uh, with the University of Charleston, Ms. Sackett. Yeah, um, this was in your packet. This will just allow us um, to receive um, occupational therapy students who were doing their field placement, sort of like student teaching, but it's for occupational therapists from the yeah. University of Charleston. Now they will come here to work. Yes, like a uh, like a student teacher would, but right. it's or, occupational or, uh, therapy, and they'll work directly with our occupational. Yeah, therapists. I wasn't sure whether this was our students kind of buying into their program or theirs into ours. Um, this is a student who's currently enrolled at the University of Charleston. 
they have to do, I think it's two field placements, two different field placements. And so she lives in Braxton County. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Any further questions for Mrs. Atkins in regards to the contract with the University of Charleston? Is that throughout the county or, or is it just certain schools or what? Uh, uh, just wherever our occupational therapist would be working. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Mrs. Atkins. Uh, I see approval of the increase in the dental uh, benefits for all regular employees. I would assume this would be Mr. Hess. about initially when I was talking about um, pay increases and teacher stipends and it's the uh, change request for dental optical from uh, from just covering 80% to 100% uh, most insurance companies you know most systems people you talk to um, it's for preventive measures you want to encourage your employees to go get checkups and things so for dental, um, I'm requesting that this board provide 100% coverage for um, our dental benefits um, for preventive measures uh, on that policy. Of course, the optical would not change. I mean, it's listed as dental optical, but the dental is what I'm asking for in preventive measures. We currently pay, pay 80% for all employees. This just kind of goes in with the package that was presented previously to give um, the uh, principals are raising to give all employees a 2.25 percent stipend and I had requested at that time um, those types of things and mentioned the uh, the uh, the dental change uh, but had not presented you with uh, uh, an approval a request for approval so it would cost us annually uh, $22,661.32 to give all of our employees 100% coverage on preventive measures for dental. Are there any questions from the superintendent in regards to the dental optical? Hearing none, thank you, Madam Superintendent. Uh, I have the approval of adding three directors, and no, four directors to the list for the stipend, Dr. Teacher. Yes. I, uh, in looking at the, um, the request for, you know, increases, I originally, I left the directors out of the, um, out of any, out of any request. Uh, by the nature of our policy, uh, when the principals received a pay raise, the, there's language that says that the principal, um, the director will not make less than the highest paid uh, principal. So that did cover several of our directors. Um, initially I did go and ask directors if they were okay, if they had any issues, and of course my directors did not. They're very supportive, very willing to go above and beyond. But when it came down to it, it appears that everybody in the county either got a stipend or they were covered within this last pay increase, except for four individuals. And um, directors. One director, um, if this board is so inclined to consider them the same 2.25% pay raise that they gave the other employees in the county, minus the directors here and of course myself, um, you know, we would, this board would be covering 10% of that 2.25% for one employee, 30% for another employee, and then 100% for two employees of the 2.25%, giving a total of, it would cost this board $5,225.22 to give these four employees the um, COVID-based stipend that was provided to everyone else in the county. I strongly advocate for this. Um, every employee in this county has worked very hard. Um, you know, this COVID has been very difficult 
experience very challenging for everyone. Um, and I did not go out and make a request for the, the um, central office directors here. But these four, they were left out because they've been in the system long enough that they didn't benefit from the previous increase last year. They didn't benefit from the most recent increase to principals, and they didn't get benefit from a stipend. So, um, fair and reasonable, to be honest with you. Um, they hated to even ask. Um, actually would be willing to even take less. But fair is fair, and I'm going to ask this board if you would consider giving, approving $5,225.22 that would give these four directors a um, stipend that I believe that they um, absolutely deserve. Are there any questions for the superintendent? At the Board of Education site, they list seven directors. I'm missing one somehow. You said eight. Uh, is, has there been a recent director appointed that? No, who listed you, that who's listed? I'm not sure. Who's listed? Uh, Sorry, I don't know. Who's listed? Tony Nichols, Rocky Roberts, Lydia Young, Tammy Gregory, Sherry Mao, Chris Hanshaw, Melissa Adkins. Well, Kevin Hess. But he's a CFO. He is. So CFO director, we consider him the same. But as far as a title as a director, um, he doesn't carry that title, but it's CFO. But every time we talk about directors, he's always just lumped in with the others. We've never, never really viewed him any differently. And when I have a director's meeting, he comes and. And we only had three directors that were under that minimum that we stated in the uh, We had policy. four, wasn't it? Were there four? Did you have Chris Hanshaw listed there also? Is he listed? Yeah, I did. I The ones, I don't mind mentioning, I'll read them to you. Oh, no, that's okay. Uh, I, just, I was going to say, I don't mind doing that. I'm, I've missed one somewhere. But, uh, I'm not sure which, I mean, I can tell you which ones I'm asking for. I don't need it. Okay. Tom Bayless. Tom Bayless is one of them. He's a director as well. That's the one you're, we're missing. But again, um, it's just fair is fair and in looking at it all, I just, you know, I realized that even though, um, you know, they were actually willing to forego it, it just, it just wasn't. I just didn't feel it was fair, so I wanted to come back and ask you if you would be willing to consider um, giving these for a stipend, just just because I think they deserve it, and it was kind of unfair that they were left out of everything. Any further questions for the superintendent in regard to the approval of adding three or adding four directors to the list for the stipend? Hearing none, thank you, Madam Superintendent. Uh, hearing none, is there a motion to approve action items A, B, C, and D as presented this evening? So moved. Mrs. Kaufman moves. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Mr. Berry seconds. Uh, is there any further discussion of the, of the action items? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Madam Secretary, the motion passes unanimously. Yes, sir. Uh, consent items, item 7, finance, uh, you receive payment of current invoices uh, electronically. Also, I believe Mr. Hess has presented some this evening for you to look at. Uh, Mr. Hess, if you come forward. Are there any? Uh, are there any questions for Mr. Hess to invite the Federal Court of Invoice? Uh, check for transfer of money we got from uh, the government's office. Mm -hmm. About $4 million. Mm -hmm. 3.4. 3.8. 3.8. Yeah. Uh, something like that. Now, is that what we have spent so far? Or is that some uh, 
Are we? Are they giving some ahead? No, that's we have spent all of that, and so this is the repayment of that loan uh, back to the governor's office. Okay, that, that's the billing that we sent. Basically. Well, they they forwarded us monies as needed, and then once we were able to get those funds back through the uh, FEMA and Decent process, then now now that we have those funds back from the federal government, we're able to reimburse the state the monies that they fronted us initially. Because for when we were doing the EA evaluations, that we weren't able to draw down any of those federal funds. However, they were, it was costing us a great deal of money, so the governor agreed to uh, give the county a loan uh, to pay for those expenses. And then once we were able to get the EA completed and it was approved, then we submitted those expenses to FEMA, it was reimbursed, and now we're ready to pay the governor back. Make sense. Pay the contractor. Or pay the governor. The governor's office back on the loan that they had given us earlier. Because we've spent. Right. Kevin, as far as the the, the FEMA payments, are they starting to come in now? Like where we've been billing out? Yeah, pretty. We're we're uh, doing pretty good. It's still a lag. Time between from the time we get it to the time we actually receive it back, but um, we're all becoming very um, trained, if you will, uh, as far as getting those in, getting them processed, and uh, into the system as quickly as possible. Uh, I think right now we're pretty well caught up through. Uh, everything's been reimbursed through August, I'm certain, and. I think September and October billings have been submitted on to uh, the federal government for reimbursement, and then we just processed the November billings. So, um, are you looking at a three-month lifetime? Or uh, it's more like two. Once you get submitted, it's more like two. It's more like two, and maybe not quite two. So, uh, we. We're just trying to get them processed as quickly as possible, and so the better, uh, the less questions, or the better our our process is, then it there's no lag time. So uh, we're all getting in the group exactly what everybody wants, what they need to see, and try to provide that on the first round, so it doesn't create a lag. Uh, as part of that ZMM's billing, most of it ZMM's billing, yes. I, I think we need to have some more meetings with them. So we need to keep up with what's going on, maybe. He, he is here uh, the first and third Monday of every week, was actually here today. And uh, we're working on updating plans so he can start coming in every other week if, if this, or he's coming in prior the day of the board meetings. Maybe and it's set yeah. up like that so that he can actually stay after and present to the board. Okay. So we can start getting him on the agenda uh, because I think we're getting enough or, late work done now. Yeah, or even have some work sessions where we can work with him. You know, I, guess, I don't know that I, that's any different than what you're saying. I have, I have teachers right now coming in and working. Teachers and principals. Every day. When they come in, like today, I had teachers and principals, so... That's actually what I'm doing with him. We're working okay. together. Okay. We're working to get it. So once we get classrooms, and well, we're now trying to get the footprint laid out. So as soon as we get it, yes, the classrooms. So um, today we got a lot accomplished with Summersville Middle School, and I believe we have the content areas laid out pretty well for the high school. At the end of this week, on Friday, I'll be meeting with him again. I'll be taking additional people with me to meet with the architect and continuing with the design. So I'm hopeful that we can start presenting some information soon. Uh, we're, we're getting there. We're getting close to being able to, to start presenting and uh, you know getting teacher feedback and stuff. But I have teachers working on it right now, teachers and principals. And actually today, I have in one of our meetings, uh, Libby Kaufman was actually here for one of our meetings uh, 
and we went ahead and presented to her so she got to see um, some of the workings with the principal and the teachers. And yeah, I'd like to do that with the whole board, being able to see too, not yeah. just individuals. Well, we can we can definitely have to be do that. Meeting. I can well, have it. I can get something well, scheduled. You have to have a work session. Is what you have to have problem. Um, Gus, maybe Gus will jump in. Yeah, we. <laughs> Again, I'm, again, I'm sorry. Again, well, we're talking about meeting with ZMM uh, guys and and being able to work with them more, a little more than we have. And yes. and Donna was talking about the, the fact that they were already having meeting with some of the instructors and principals. Uh, and I I was saying I think the whole board would like to meet with them to kind of understand what's going on. Uh, I believe that he's coming back on the 21st. Is that correct, Dr. Teacher? Yes, um, that's the plan. Wow. The first, yeah, he, it's, we're meeting the first and third. So what he told me is typically we do that we get the design put together to the point, it's really not to look together to the point to present to anyone. Right. So he said, he told me that they get this design put together and then come in and present just like we did on the Richwood one when he brought it up, put it up on the TV, and said this is what where we're going with it. So he's trying to get it to that stage. Well, yeah, I don't. Uh, go ahead. Well, I, I didn't know that you were meeting with the with teachers and principals and stuff, yeah. and that's good. Yeah. So after we after we have this footprint established, uh, we'll be bringing in the. Um, the core uh, academic teachers to uh, take a look at it, but I think it's starting to come together. I mean, we had to have something to work with, so we'll be inviting them in, and then once we get them in, we'll be establishing our plan, our plan for the programs to be implemented in the schools. And of Dr. course, Chief, the members. Dr. Chief, why don't we plan on the twenty-first? We'll see where he is. And we, uh, we might be able to do something that day, if not, maybe early January. I hope the 21st is going to be the phone call. Oh, I think the 21st is a phone call. Yeah, it is, since it's going to be Since Christmas it's a holiday. Oh, uh, then let's go with the 1st of January, maybe the 1st of January or the 2nd of January. Yep, so he, so the plan is each board meeting, that's when he'll be up, and he can actually come in and start presenting to you all each board meeting if you'd like. He'll be here in the evening. For the, for the meeting. Yeah, he'll be here through the day also. I think what Mr. Berry is saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, is uh, we're dragging the line. we got to go a little faster. Well. Uh, with the, uh, the contractor, uh, it seems like we're just in slow mode. Now, I'm not talking about the teachers and all that meeting, but uh, goodness, it's taken forever. Yeah. Is that what you're? Well, yeah, that's part of it. I, I just, I'd like to see something moving, and, uh, and I, I understand it is. And it's a big, they're big projects. If you want to get them right, you know, you don't want to leave anybody out. I guess, I guess one of the things that um, Dr. Penix and and uh, Ms. Kaufman are the two that sit in from the board on this, on the meetings, on the call-in. So, you know, it's as far as having those, you know, design committee meetings, it's been pretty intense. And with having everything drawn up, I think that there, today there was a lot accomplished. So I'm hopeful that he can have something ready to present. I'll be going back down Friday, this Friday meeting with him again. He's supposed to take all the changes that we have. Mr. Bayless has been very instrumental uh, with the design. He can speak to it also and getting the schedules together and, and we'll have something ready to present. Um, I've pushed as hard as I can possibly push. And well, maybe we can nudge a little bit. Well, there's been nudging. <laughs> <laughs> I think we had quite a bit of nudging about a week ago. We there, really started pushing uh, to get something done and get it done soon. Because yeah. 
because those two have been on the committee. So as far as report outs, I mean, I usually just give the update when I when I speak. But Dr. Penny and Libby were the two that you all put on the committee. So it's been it's been a pretty um, pretty intense. Uh, it's been very very involved, and uh, you know I have everything laid out on my desk with all the different changes. I mean, there's just piles of papers and charts. But the 100% of the focus right now is on the Glade Creek, on trying to get everything together. But he, he will be back, and he will be back before each board meeting, and he can pre start presenting to the board each board meeting. Um, but see, Mr. Burry didn't know that. Right. And he should have been told, quite frankly. Well, he probably should have been. Well, I'm just, after almost five years, I'm getting anxious, I guess, like everybody else, you know. Uh, Me too. I, I, the weather will be a factor now, won't it? But, uh, it won't, we won't get much done until spring, unless no. the winter breaks. Well, the main thing, I think, is getting the footprint Just get it done ready to so they can put out that package. Uh, right. Grading you know, package. Yeah, I give... Yeah, the grading package. Each board meeting, right. I give an update of what's happened. So I don't think I've missed any portion of things that's happened. When I present, I present on what's been updated. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's just been a lot of planning. It's been a lot of uh, consulting. Um, I, 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 it's I, I, it's yeah. frustrating for me. <laughs> There's so many things going on to begin with. And it takes your attention and distractions from being able to focus on one thing. Well, uh, in all honesty, it just uh, seems like we're in slow motion. So. The past couple of meetings was really when it started kind of come together somewhat. Before that, it was it was focused on the Cherry River complex. Yeah, that's where the focus had been, and now it's been the focus has shifted to getting the Golly River up, Glade, Glade Creek. I'm sorry, getting the Glade Creek up to speed, mm -hmm. and. Um, a lot was accomplished today, and uh, you know, if you. if you you know, in any of those sessions, if you want to come in and and see you know, what's happening, happy to do that. Um, you come in and take my system. Well, no, I mean that's fine. We, I mean, I, I'll gladly let you stay on my. Doctor Chudrick, he possibly could. Uh, be there for the 21st to give us an update or goodbye telephonically like I'm doing. Yes, I'm sure he can, yes. Okay. Uh, are there any further questions uh, for Mr. Hess in regards to finance items? Hearing no, thank you, Mr. Hess. Uh, is there a motion to send item A, which can occur in the uh, finance payment, occur in the invoices? Is there a motion to approve that? So moved. Mr. Amy Boos, is there a second to the motion? Second. Mr. Barry seconds. Uh, all of those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. Madam have the secretary the motion passes unanimously. Uh, personnel, uh, Madam Superintendent, Mrs. Atkins, board members of the for executive session regarding personnel matters. No. Okay. Oh man, my pages are sticking together and I'm trying not to lick my fingers. <laughs> oh, oh, hard to break. I'm telling you. I've got an updated personnel agenda, and I have it's been a while since I've given you the vacancy list, so I've also got the vacancy list.
so that vacancy list is just just for your information you can just look over it um, we've got 17 professional vacancies all of our um, service positions are filled and uh, I didn't double check the coaching ones because I think all of our winter sports are filled I think we got a couple of spring sports which of course we'll just kind of lay aside until we see what COVID's going to do for the personnel agenda um, the agenda was amended also on Thursday those changes were in red the changes for tonight are highlighted in yellow um, but I will read those um, out loud there's been a, a copy made available to the public including the press under professional for substitute teacher added two names Rhonda White and Kaylee Hughes um, then under consent items, Jane Alderman resigns her position as aide with Nicholas County Schools, effective November 30th, 2020. Joseph Prather resigns his position as track coach for Nicholas County High School, effective December 7th, 2020. And to approve the placement of Courtney Hoover as occupational therapy student with the University of Charleston with Nicholas County Schools for her required field experience. And then I have also attached a leave request, which I will not read out loud to protect the employee's privacy. What is a restricted substitute teacher? Um, that is a new position that's been created this year because there's such a shortage of substitutes. So a restricted substitute is someone who has an associate's degree or is a student teacher. So they're <coughs> they're doing their student teaching process this would allow them to serve as substitutes in certain positions or people with an associate's degree um, we actually had to get a waiver from the Department of Ed to hire these positions because we have a shortage of substitutes so this is kind of like the first year that they've tried this and hopefully this is going to be something that um, that will be around for a while I mean we just have a hard time we just don't have a whole lot of people that have four-year degrees and that's what you have to have to be a substitute teacher so this is really going to open that up and really I think uh, allow us to hire some good quality people that I think are unfairly not being considered for being a substitute teacher. <laughs> uh, Ms. Atkins, could you explain to everybody what the step three pay with that individual teacher was yes um, you remember through when the legislature uh, passed big omnibus reform bill part of that was allowing um, for a, a step three increment for teachers of math and and special education so they get three additional years of experience for pay if they're teaching math or special education and are fully certified so step three is a third year Yes. Uh, are there any further questions for Mrs. Atkins in regard to personnel? Well, just food for thought. Um, you know, we talked about in the past how we'd like to help the coaches with the raise, the teachers. Um, uh, medical bills and what have you. Um, do you know when someone works 30, 40, 45 years, um, we ought to be thinking uh, somehow we need to recognize people who gave their whole career to working with students. And unfortunately, I know that would be manpower to work on that, but uh, you know, we just uh, have a meeting and say, well, we accept their, their resignation, but it, you know what I'm trying to say. I, I think it's a great idea, actually. Yeah, I'll, I'll look into that and see what we can do. Are there any further questions for Mrs. Atkins in regard to personnel? I think that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Eric Dunn, is there a motion to approve the personal agenda as presented in the city? Okay. <laughs> Eric Dunn, is there a motion to approve the personal agenda as presented in the city? I do have one question. I'm sorry. Uh, when it says approval, they don't have to be certified, right? But they do have to have degrees. 
for. But then they have to, to be a substitute, and then they have to be certified or approved by the, the part, West right. Virginia Department of Education. So to be a substitute teacher, um, there's actually a certification that the Department of Ed issues to every. If, if you retire and you're a certified teacher, you don't have to do this. But when we hire people who just, you know, who just work as, so we have a number of those who have a four-year degree who aren't teachers who work as substitute teachers. And for those people, they have to be issued a uh, substitute teacher certificate from the Department of Ed. They have to undergo 12 hours of training, which we provide. And um, we do this all online, and so that allows us to get people through quickly. And they also have to have six hours of classroom observation, have to undergo a background check. And so all that's sent to the Department of Ed, and then they approve it. And it's the same exact same training for a restricted substitute. They call it a restricted substitute because if you have a four-year degree, then uh, no matter what your four-year degree is, you can serve in a long-term substitute position. These restricted substitutes can only serve in one position for 10 days. So if we've got a teacher out on maternity leave for a year, we can't put a restricted substitute in, in that position for a year. They can only substitute for 10 days. So if we've got somebody out for, you know, a week, um, that person could fill that. And these people are most likely going to fill the day-to-day -day slots. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further questions for Mrs. Adkins in regards to the personnel agenda? Um, just for clarification here, uh, generally I know have a good idea of what's going on, but on this updated paper? Yes. Um, where it says awaiting principal action, I take it that they'd like to have somebody, but there's no applicants to. Um, some of them, the posting has come down, and they have applicants they considered. Some of them are waiting until so now you've got people who are graduating. I mean, like you can post positions in, in October, but Anybody that's certified that doesn't have a job in October are usually not people that, that you want. So they wait to get a fresh graduate pool. Um, so there's, there's several things that kind of factors in play there. Well, there's uh, the Richwood schools have a lot of openings. Yes. Yes. And some of those have been posted, I mean, the, like the math and the science, that's been vacant for over a year. The social studies was vacant for a long time, we filled it, and then that person is moving to Summersville Middle um, at the beginning of next year unless we hire his replacement. And then Golly River, too, we've had several positions there that have been vacant for over a year. You know, part of the good news of that is when we go make our personnel cuts um, based on enrollment, we've got places for people to land. So, so that's a good thing. So, I mean, that, that's we've been very fortunate the last several years. We've cut positions, but all of our people have been able to find a job because they've just filled vacancies. But we still have fewer people, you know, on the books, so to speak. So, I'm um, I'm hoping maybe. Personnel season when we shift some people around and we can get some of these filled. Well, I'm uh, Tony or Sarah, and uh, I'm wanting, uh, I'm telling the board we're headed for the end of the 10, and I've got a bunch of openings here at schools. That's going to pull you down mm -hmm. yeah. from the 10. It's, it's challenging. It's challenging. And like I said, some of these positions have been, have been posted multiple times they've been i post them on the statewide uh, job bank um so but uh, we're not alone in this this is county school boards across the state any further questions for mrs adkins very good if there are motions to approve the personnel agenda is presented this evening Second. Mr. Anthony Moose, is there a second to the second. motion? Second. Mr. Moose seconds. Uh, is there any further discussion regarding the personnel matters? Hearing none, all of those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, uh, those opposed, 
life sign. Madam uh, Secretary, the motion passes unanimously. Yes, sir. Uh, item number nine, superintendent's information, construction planning architect. Uh, Madam Superintendent, I assume you probably uh, have something to add. an update on our progress and what we've uh, we've been doing um, again we've we have continued to work on the school designs um, for the past two years um, I've had work programs of study developed for for two years for the Glade Creek property um, as it's continued to be refined and the planning that's been involved has been tremendous um, this is not just a traditional school, it's very innovative in the learning environments, the learning spaces are going to help facilitate this very innovative new learning environment. Um, it's caused a lot of planning to occur. Uh, I know the architect, the last words he said when he walked out of the day is that he'll be surprised if there isn't a national award issued for the planning of this school. Um, it's been very intense. It's been very thoughtful um, in the process. As you guys are aware, in doing all the planning on the Ridgewood schools, um, it's been your core group, your two board members that have been, you know, that were involved then. Now we've got two board members now that's been involved and, and pretty well you know, in tune with what's going on. I do give updates every board meeting, um, but fortunately now, it's just been a long, drawn-out process. Um, it appears that things are, are really starting to come together um, to the point that Friday, um, you know, I'm going to be working with the uh, architects some more and the engineers. Uh, and putting forth what all that was decided today. I feel excellent with what's going on with the middle school part. I also feel really, really good about the high school component. And um, I'm hopeful that the layout of the programs will be uh, completed by Friday. I'm very hopeful of that. So once we get some of those programs laid out, the plan is uh, the first and third you know, board meeting days that the architect will be present at this board meeting uh, or be present at the school, at this board office and actually be able to come in and present to the board on the updates and where we stand. Um, the other next big component is going to be other than just having the footprint. The footprint is critical because we need to get the bid packages out. So the construction manager also worked with us today and in with the details. So um, giving you know input on, uh, it's just a process. I, I'm, it's my first time of building a school. I know that Chris Hanshaw and I know that Kevin, you know, they've been involved in building schools before, so it's kind of like, you know, they know what to expect. I don't really, uh, it's, just, it's just been a very intense process. But I believe things are coming together to the point that it's going to start exciting people. I'm going to be able to roll something out. Um, I did send um, our architect a message of just a minute ago asking him to be available December 21st, um, you know, and if uh, to present or to talk about what he has. Hopefully he's in a position that he can present something. I'm not sure that he will be, but um, to discuss the plans and what's going on. Um, we have... Um, really strong programs laid out that I think will be desirable for all students in our county uh, that they'll want to participate in. And, um, and that's been a very challenging aspect in determining those programs. Um, you know, and I also believe that um, as soon as this, the footprint, everything's ready for the, you know, layout or the dozer work for the, the property, um, our next step is to start pulling in our academic teachers and um, NCTE and people locally and across the state to actually work on the curriculum. 
Um, the curriculum is going to be a pretty big deal because we're going to have to have content standards and objectives written for each of the programs, um, the, the state adopted ones, and then we need to, then, then I'm going to be using our teachers to actually determine um, the best way to provide, provide examples and applications uh, from their core content areas, English, math, social studies, to their related, act, their related um, skilled fields such as cosmetology. So you'll have your English and math and your social studies and your science all at that academy. And then students, the examples um, and in English and math and things like that will be related to uh, as much as possible. We're, trying, we're now determining the percentage if it should be 60% or 80% of the content from the core academic actually related to the skilled area to show relevance to students. So the application will be really important. And that's something that is going to be important for our teachers to be involved in and come up with a, repos a repository of, um, of examples and uh, project-based activities for each of these academies. Very intense, but those are the types of things that um, we will be working on while the facility is actually being constructed. So we're getting closer. It's been a um, pretty intense process and um, hopefully we can start getting some stuff revealed. Um, I know the first of the year I'm hopeful that we can actually, after presenting to the board um, our preliminary steps of, of what's laid out, we can actually start inviting the public in to give their input as well. So the teachers will be very involved. We have teachers now, but our um, core academic teachers, to get them involved in working through the processes and then having community members invited in, just as we did in the Richwood area schools, to give their input into the new, um, the new facility. So that's something that I'm hopeful that will really progress in January. So give us a month and I think we'll be there. It's people were tired, and it's been a very long process, and I understand why people are tired. Um, if we were doing just a traditional school, um, I don't think it would not be as challenging. But this is really taxing everyone. Um, both of the construction managers here today, who have worked all over the United States, um, they they said they're just honored to be a part of such a project. So. It's very involved, and I think people will be very excited once we're able to start rolling some of it out. Um, so, I can answer any questions you have, but it's, it's been a very uh, intense process. Well, I'd just like to say, as a board member of the Nichols County Board of Education, that I'm excited about the prospect of both being able to have the traditional school and also having the big comprehensive school so we can have really the best of both in this county and the students that want this comprehensive you know and everything that goes with that they will be afforded that but the ones that they don't really want that they want with more like the traditional smaller school they'll be able to go that route so i think we're kind of getting the best of both and um, that excites me as a former board member for the county. I agree, it does give people the option. And I think that's really going to be important. Any further questions for the superintendent regarding her in regards to her information? Madam Superintendent, thank you. Uh, item two on this evening's agenda are reports. Uh, the first is the SESC. Uh, I did attend that meeting uh, at the uh, late uh, November, and uh, there's a few things discussed in there. Uh, what was about uh, the process of providing uh, uh, opportunities for people to do graduate work through uh, Concord College. Uh, and then also there were uh, options presented as to how the schools could, uh, other alternatives they could use in the virtual learning process for our students. And I have shared that information with the superintendent, so she's aware of that to share with her staff uh, in regard to uh, what we might do in our schools. 
Uh, also, uh, I sent you an email a couple of days ago regarding the school board certification. Uh, there are now four modules available for your training. Uh, you have seminars required training. If you attended the training in September, you've got five of those seven. And, uh, you, uh, and you need two more hours. If you were at the November the 30th training, I think it was. No, it wasn't. It was the 23rd training. You got two additional hours, so you have seven hours now. If you weren't a part of the September, excuse me, the November 23rd training, then you will need to pick up at least two of these online trainings. There are four out there, each worth one hour. I would also encourage you to go ahead and, and, and listen to them because I think there are some very important topics uh, concerning uh, the operation of school boards. So uh, I would encourage you to uh, look at those as well. Any questions on that? Yeah, guys. Uh, yes. I looked over that material today, and I didn't see, I didn't either understand or see anywhere to connect to those four sessions or individual sessions. Uh, I would ask uh, Mr. Valento if you would contact School Board Association and ask her to provide uh, additional information on how to access those videos. Yes, sir. And uh, if you don't mind, email that to all five of us. Yes, sir. Uh, Brian Lewis, Mrs. Colton. Um, I was not able to attend that meeting. I had an abscess tooth. That was fun. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, item 11 on this evening's agenda. Uh, Madam Secretary, do we have any delegations this evening? No, sir. Thank you. Item 12, items for future agendas. Board members, any items for future agendas? I think I heard clearly tonight we'd like to have uh, updates from the architect, so we'll be looking at how we might that incorporate that into the agenda. Uh, item 13, future meeting dates. Uh, LSIC meeting on Tuesday, December the 15th. That will be conducted at Glade Creek Elementary. Uh, we'll be hearing from five schools at that time. Then we have our next regular scheduled meeting on uh, Monday, December the 21st, uh, here at the board office at 5 o'clock p.m. Uh, before we close, Mr. Moose, uh, you will provide Mrs. Valletta with the final communication that you talked about earlier today. Uh, and it also should reflect uh, who's asking for those responses, you know, who, uh, who all's involved in that. And uh, I think it really, uh, we have to, uh, uh, it's a fair question to say, you know, the superintendent should be involved in those communications. And uh, I didn't hear her name. So if you would provide that stuff to Mrs. Blood, I'd greatly appreciate it. Is there uh, a motion to adjourn this evening's meeting? Not yet. Okay. I should have, uh... I should have said something on the future agenda. I think the health department or someone in the immediate future, we're going to be uh, receiving a vaccine. Will that go, my question will be, uh, what about the frontliners teachers? Will they be uh, receiving that? I know that uh, the medical people will. Just food for thought. I can I can check with the health department and ask them if they've got information to come present. You know, I, personally, I think teachers ought to have it, but I'm not in that. I'm not running that. Well, at least have the option. What'd you say? Have the option. Yeah. Can't hear people in your mouth. This is just covering your mouth, not your ears. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
same time. Aye. Those opposed, like sign. Madam Secretary, we are adjourned at 7.05 p.m.